I would like to talk about my work. It also participated in this, uh, well, review, and it seems to me that it has, well, in the course of the latest conclusions, it is practically able to fill each of these gaps, that is, uh, to respond there. Unfortunately, we were only allowed to present it in poster form. No one understood anything. Now I have sent it to this very journal. So uh, there is a review process going on, and it seems like people are getting interested in this matter. They are starting to write me more and more letters. I once again emphasize that uh, we worked on practically different types of reactors, including, uh, well, bringing this Lenner to a fast reaction uh, in the form of an explosion, in the form of detonation. Uh, this specifically goes back to Avramenko, their uh, his launch uh, uh, of the Avramenko generator, which is capable of producing this, but here it is shapeless uh, clump, uh, but in reality it's uh, carbon hydrogen plasma. That is, there are clusters of carbon and, uh, well, free hydrogen ions uh, are produced. So, uh, ahem, uh, our goals uh, uh, of our work uh, were, uh, after all, uh, to use uh, cheap clusters uh, that are easily uh, produced and with established methods. These are carbon clusters, that is carbon nanostructures. So hydrogen ions from what? From natural gas, uh, from direct uh, natural, uh, from uh, made polymers. Well, for example, polyethylene, which are capable. So we use it as a working medium. Uh, the emphasis is on uh, closing the main gap that, uh, uh, as indicated by Nagel, is the creation of cheap carbon nanoclusters. As far as I understand, uh, only one group in the world is going this route. They are currently using graphene as nanostructures. So, uh, well, the result is also interesting. So. You have to keep an eye on everything and not get conceited. Well, in this plasma, Avramenko also published in his book, Ball Lightning in the Laboratory, that uh, the coefficient can be uh, from two to four. So no one believed it and no one well cites it. But actually, it was in 1978 there. Uh, uh, well, uh, and we actually, uh, what we actually used this uh, as a starting point and moved on to the problem of, well, detonating this uh, metastable plasma, uh, which, so to speak, is generated by the Avramenko uh, generator in our research. That is uh, to make a detonator for such metastable plasma. It, its lifespan is very long, almost a second. So you discharge a capacitor onto, onto the gun. I'll show you more in a moment. But it would seem, boom, if you do it with a capacitor on the casing, it will sound quite loud. And instead, uh, conditions can be created where uh, such a plasma jet will be formed uh, with a lifespan of about uh, one second with an energy capacity of 100 electron volts per particle. If just by the size of the jet, you know how many joules you put in there. So 100 uh, electron volts and quite cold, where the temperature is below 600 Kelvin, that is the average temperature of the object across the reservoir, that is. Well, this is all published. You can, uh, well, look it up. All our works now have, well, the citation index of the latest uh, uh, experiments, uh, well, third, fourth there, but uh, here's research gate now uh, reaching 500 references in the last year. Well, I think uh, they congratulated us, saying you're already approaching a thousand, guys. Well, and the second thing we stated is that we don't need uh, to invent calorimeters because uh, uh, during detonation, uh, the most accurate release, that is measurement of stored energy, which is the basis of all physical chemistry, in essence, 
all of physical chemistry was developed based on experiments conducted in explosive mixtures, for example, a hydrogen-oxygen mixture in a shock tube. They created a shock tube with specific parameters and observed at what speed, at what Mach number, ignition of this medium would occur. So uh, it ignited, producing a detonation wave. Well, since there were no high-speed cameras at that time, so to speak, they used the slit method. So uh, the wave moves, uh, it itself unfolds the reaction zone, and it could be recorded on film on a rotating drum, uh, registering. Uh, well, that's how they studied lightning, that's how they studied explosions. This is called the slit method. So it was possible to unravel and measure the reaction times of the reaction speed. So, uh, actually, uh, in this mode, when detonation waves are used uh, in a shock tube or in some volume, well, uh, the method is like a bomb, so to speak, uh, like that. So, uh, these are spheres, cold metaspheres, where, for example, hydrogen was exploded. So, uh, you measure what? Uh, the speed of this wave, that's one. And you can measure uh, the pressure, well, with pressure sensors. So, well, if there is an interferometer and the density is good. So, there are books that, well, yes, the accuracy of this method is record-breaking there because the losses over microseconds on the wall are negligible. Uh, so, uh, light losses as a rule are made small by various tricks, you see. Uh, well, it's all classic. The classic works. There's a tube, there's a flow from the left, then there's a zone where you uh, supply energy Q, and after the reaction, there's the reacted mixture, there's H2O, and it moves at speed 2. So, it would seem that if you have a, a detonation wave, or if you consider, well, the surface on the left, inside, on the right, then you can write the conservation loss uh, in the approximation of small losses. So, the law of mass conservation is essentially density multiplied uh, by the volume of momentum. So, at the front of the shock or detonation wave, and the additional shock waves involve the appearance of chemical energy Q. Uh, that is uh, not only entropy, the law of energy conservation. These are the three conservation laws. From them, you can derive, uh, for example, the pressure jump behind the detonation wave. Uh, it includes this Q and the Mach number speed. Therefore, by measuring Mach and pressure, you can uniquely determine the value of Q. Here, the unknown is the density ratio. So, uh, well, uh, from two equations, and Q, from two equations, you can always find two unknowns. So, basically, we propose this calorimetry method, which no one in Lennar, in physics, has used, even though it is obvious and the most accurate. So, what did we do? Uh, that means two points, uh, cheap propellant, and it's a calorimeter. And the third point is, in essence, the detonator itself is the generator of this plasma. We declare that we are the first to do this, meaning that uh, no one has done it before us. Uh, what does uh, Avramenko's generator represent? Well, inside it is usually a cathode, here, this white or gray thing uh, with a tiny little hole is a capillary. So, uh, the working substance is inserted. Let's say uh, plexiglass or polyethylene. The, the, the blue one is your anode. Uh, so, uh, here you have uh, usually a, a grounded plate. And this is one part of the generator that we made it is capable of creating this erosion jet. 
the walls of the channel evaporate, so the pressure increases and this erosion jet, which consists of decomposed hydrocarbon, is pushed out. Separately on the periphery, nanoclusters are formed. We analyzed them, collected their sizes, so to speak, their frequency and recorded spectra. Uh, and inside this, uh, there is a hydrogen core. So it's like a cable structure. Clusters are outside and hydrogen is inside. Well, uh, here's another question. Why is this cable structure designed this way? Ions don't like each other. Uh, they kind of come out. Uh, for the second generator, it can essentially be a detonator of any design, but it was important for us that this detonator creates uh, neutron-like or, so to speak, real neutrons in this hydrogen plasma. Uh, so, uh, essentially, uh, these are the rods. It's called a plasma-focused device. And inside, instead of this plasma jet, so to speak, there is usually an axial electrode. The axial electrode here is the anode. And then these are the cathodes. Usually the anode electrode is shorter than the cathode. Uh, it allows us to observe uh, a phenomenon called plasma focus in the anode area. When plasma goes from the anode to the cathode and plasma cords go from the cathode to the anode. Now I will show you it will be clearly visible in the film. Uh, so, the, they converge at one point, and near this point, a small sphere forms. It's called the plasma focus. The device is called a plasma focus. And uh, essentially, we use this detonator to disrupt this jet. So, uh, this kind of combination, uh, well, uh, he called it a hedgehog with a snake, I guess because, because of how it looks. It has proven itself very effective. This is a unique installation. It will probably be uh, replicated around the world because it is inexpensive to uh, manufacture and uh, works uh, reliably. Well, here you can see the experimental installation. This little cannon has been assembled. So here we are using a battery to create this uh, erosion jet. And for the detonator, well, uh, a small block is used, so to speak. So it's uh, under the table right now. Well, the current and voltage are being measured. And here we filmed around this. From here it crawls out. So now you will see in the film a plasma formation like this with high speed creating a shock wave. Uh, so we observed how uh, the shockwave weekend, uh, utilizing mobile microphones and piezo sensors to observe how the pressure was distributed around this type of machine, this type of generator. So the main advantages of uh, this generator, which I have again detailed here, are because it was the first machine of its kind ever made. So. Uh, in the first stages, it was capable of uh, creating this uh, energy-rich uh, hydrocarbon plasma. In the third stage, we implemented the detonation mode. So now about the working substances. Uh, here it shows, this is a monomer of plexiglass, stearin, paraffin, polyethylene, and other substances to compare, like corundum aluminum oxide, where the erosion was very, very small. So uh, ceramics on the working inserts. Well, in the MPC, we usually used, so to speak, a capacitor of such dimensions, charged up to four kilovolts, but it banged well on its own because it was 300 joules, in this, uh, in the Avramenko generator, we had a more modest input, 80 joules, and into the shock tube, the calibration one. In the calibration experiments, we found out that uh, from this um, electrostatic energy uh, of the charged capacitor, well, uh, approximately, uh, it goes 30% uh, uh, of this value. That is not all the electrical energy was used, but it's clear why. There are connecting wires, inductance, scattered magnetic, mainly scattered magnetic field. So, 
and at a distance from 10 to 100 centimeters, we recorded this pressure distribution. The consumption of the substance per shot was approximately one milligram per shot. That is, everything was weighed, carefully observed. Well, the erosion generator itself, it produced such a narrowly directed collimated shock plasma jet, which well glows white inside. So this is hydrogen uh, outside. Uh, this is mainly blue and violet. Uh, this, so to speak, is uh, CO2 glowing, so to speak. These are monomers of carbon clusters. Well, and here the jet is already formed. We, uh, with the help of these, um, here are the initiators shown here. Uh, using these detonator horns, this plasma focus carries out the detonation of this formation. And this, like on rails, this white plasma, so to speak, the cocoon, uh, it spread uh, in one direction. The directed explosion was achieved at speeds of, well, here we wrote an average of two kilometers per second. That's hypersonic. And so the maximum speed was up to 10 kilometers per second. That's what we achieved. Well, the noise was, uh, so to speak, decent. Here are the main signals. But when this one sprayer sprayed, though you can't see it here, it went psh there, literally. As I say, it's even, uh, well, it's a metastable object. The energy is kind of in a preserved state. So, and in the detonator, it's quite these 300 joules. The blue ones, the green ones. That's a different three kilovolts, four kilovolts. We looked at how the detonator itself goes off, from which the energy needed to be subtracted. When we did everything together, uh, it turned out that the pressure was inverted, you know. Uh, so uh, this pressure is uh, at least three times higher than, uh, so to speak, the energy in the detonator was. But this is the impulse of the current in the detonator itself. Uh, that's basically it. We measured uh, this delay. From this delay, the average speed of the shock wave could be determined. And we looked at graphs uh, to see how it attenuated with distance, how the pressure decreased with distance to bring it to this size, to this. So, uh, what will be the maximum pressure in this area um, near the plasma piston? Well, near the piston, it turned out to be tens of atmospheres. So, uh, what does that mean? Uh, well, we measured uh, the speed, uh, which gives us 2 kilowatts per second. Uh, well, that's in the air. That's about 6 maximum. So, the volume is 10 cubic centimeters of this piston, approximately when it stopped. So it was at the maximum size. So uh, the energy that we measured uh, was uh, 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 calibrated using the pressure from uh, a normal discharge. These sensors were calibrated several times. Uh, it means when just the spark gap itself was working without uh, this active medium, it follows from this. And uh, when this sensor was placed in the shock tube, it was calibrated there as it should be. Uh, we observed that uh, this sensor was calibrated uh, depending on the speed of the shock wave. This, uh, so to speak, in advance, somewhere very thoroughly. This was back when I was working on plasma aerodynamics. So look, by measuring delta P, we get 320 joules. So uh, at uh, 100 uh, joules, so to speak, invested, uh, invested in this uh, specific experiment in the detonator. So well, you can see that it's not so little. But if you subtract that, it still comes out to 200 joules. So uh, the estimates of this specific energy reserve, which is released uh, with a work working substance consumption of approximately one milligram, we get 200 divided by one milligram, which gives us this value, two mega electron volts per atom. This is close to what Dr. Parkamov reported.